Hi, I'm Ron Tompkins. Um, I'm a surgeon at Massachusetts General Hospital and a scientist. Uh, I'm a co-director of the OMF, Collaborative Research Center at uh, Harvard-affiliated hospitals. Uh, I wish to apologize. We are in a movie uh, studio office, and uh, there will be some background noise. Please try to ignore that. And I'm Alan Gerwitt. Uh, I'm a uh, former child psychiatrist. I'm retired now. I've had ME for 32 years, and um, Ron has asked me to tell you something about my experience. Well, but just to get us started here, uh, can you tell me how did you come about with ME and how did you, how did it start and develop for you? Okay. Uh, well, it started abruptly. I mean, I was fine one day and the next day I could barely get out of bed. I didn't know what in the world it was. Uh, and. None of the physicians I consulted um, uh, knew either, and uh, the strong hint was uh, go see a psychiatrist. Um, Ironic, because you are a psychiatrist. Yeah, I am a psychiatrist. I was in analysis many years. I know myself pretty well, and I know this was not a psychiatric issue, which makes me think uh, I followed that particular thread over many years, uh, learning how uh, the terms evolved, ME and uh, CFS, and what the history was, and the ups and downs, which I, I find to be fascinating, but uh, no one really knows that very well. Um, I might as well go on with that because uh, it, it turns out that the first epidemic that was reported was in 1934 at the Los Angeles General Hospital. Uh, and then uh, people have recorded other epidemics over 70 uh, since then, small epidemics. So perhaps the term epidemic doesn't really pertain. Clusters. Clusters would be a better term, yeah. Um, uh, and uh, at that time, with uh, all these uh, clusters going on, uh, the thinking in medicine was that this is an organic illness, and um, it's probably infectious. Uh, and the, 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 many of them were studied pretty well, but particularly the one at the Royal Free Hospital in London in 1955, which closed down the hospital and the medical school and everything. There were over 300 people who were affected, uh, one of whom I know uh, is a good friend of mine. Uh, she was a medical student at that hospital and has been a co-writer, a co-author on things uh, with me. Um, the, uh, uh, about 15 years later, uh, a, uh, two psychiatrists, British psychiatrists, uh, wrote a paper published in the British Medical Journal saying that, well, you know, the epidemic, so-called epidemic back then in 1955, uh, it was really epidemic hysteria, they called it. And uh, it is not at all organic. And uh, of course, their methodology was terrible. Pseudoscience. Um, and then they published more about all those other epidemics where mass hysteria of some form. Um, and by golly, that paper stimulated other British psychiatrists to uh, look into it and more papers were written, uh, and the uh, research got more and more sophisticated, but the um, uh, assumption was wrong. No matter how sophisticated, the assumption was basically wrong. That, uh, it's interesting. I did not know that history 
in the beginning, it, ironically, it was considered an organic disease, potentially yes. infectious. Yes. And, and suddenly, uh, much later, it turned around to be uh, a psychiatric disease. Yes. And that certainly has hampered the field ever since. Uh, that's a very uh, kind word. I think it was devastating in its m impact over 40 years. All organic research, or most of it, stopped. Uh, of course, we have much advanced tools now, but nevertheless, uh, we were in, in 2015 with the IOM report coming out. Um, we were f 40 years behind we could, where dark we could ages, have been really in the dark, dark ages. That dark cloud of um, its psychosomatic has come over the Atlantic Ocean and it went around the world. Um, and we, in our local state association, struggle with finding physicians who know enough about ME to uh, evaluate and treat patients that... Let me ask you about that. Yeah. Uh, many patients I talk to find access to uh, healthcare very difficult. What has, you're a physician, how, how has it impacted you? Well, uh, in several ways. Uh, I had a mild case. You know, there's a bell-shaped curve, a mild, uh, moderate, and uh, severely ill. About the 25% are severely ill. Um, I had a relatively mild case. Occasionally, it turned moderate, a little higher level, but Basically, I was able to uh, see patients, do my work. I had a reduced amount of time, and um, weekends were just resting up for the week. Um, but it, it, uh, it, I was still able to do some work, and then there were two events that really uh, made me turn a corner on, on this. One was, uh, I gave a talk at the Institute of Living in Hartford. It was a, then a famous psychiatric hospital. And I was, uh, I was um, supervisor of the child fellows. The, there was a, a physician in the audience, and I didn't know him before, and he uh, came up to me afterwards when I talked about the little bit that I knew at that time and said that he thinks he has uh, ME, although it was then called CFS, uh, and he's having a really hard time struggling. He was an obstetrician, and his practice group was getting very nervous about him. Uh, and he was very sad about that and very um, confused about what really did he have. But my talk had uh, helped him to know uh, and then I had some telephone contact, but um, two months later, his practice group kicked him out of the group, and uh, just viciously so, it was just harshly uh, difficult. Um, and I had left Hartford about that time to come up to Boston, and uh, I heard from his wife, and from someone else in the Hartford area that he had committed suicide. Oh my. And um, I was struck by that, that how horrible that was, how uh, inhumanely he was treated and ridiculed. Uh, and I got a glimpse of what happened to patients with the illness. There was another situation um, a few years later, uh, I was looking for places where CFS was discussed in, in conference form. The American Psychiatric Association met with the, Kinetic, the uh, Canadian Psychiatric Association in Toronto, and uh, I was eager to go, and I did go. Um, 
And I heard uh, there were four people on the panel. Uh, one was an English professor from Princeton. One was a notorious psychiatrist in Toronto. And, um, and then I also on the panel was Tony Komarov. Uh, I came in a little bit late. I moved slowly. And he uh, he'd finished his initial talk. Uh, I hadn't ever heard him before. But um, as these, uh, the panelists went on and on with this, uh, this sort of uh, ridiculing of patients, of denigrating them, of how uh, it's related to feminism, and said the English professor with great uh, assurity. Um, this sounds horrible. It was horrible. Uh, now there's and no, I other, got, no other way to describe it. I got angrier and angrier and angrier. And finally, I couldn't stand it. I got up and I, I basically bawled out the audience that I was uh, struck with the kind of tone, the attitude, the lack of knowledge when there was so much we didn't know. I was there really were, There were supposed to be professionals. That's right. Actually, healthcare professionals, and yet. And they were not. Uh, uh, this but, sounds, you've had, you have some awful stories to tell. Yes. And uh, unfortunately, as I get to know patients, I, I find there's some pretty cruel uh, treatments of patients, even within their own family. Yes. And it, right. it just creates so, so much additional burden. Absolutely. And when the family the, the disease needs to be recognized as an organic disease, well, when the and physician, we move forward. When the physician says, uh, it's all on your mind, um, go see a psychiatrist, uh, and the family uh, gets mixed messages, not sure what to do, and they may disbelieve their relative, it's a terrible downer for patients. Like, no one believes me, no one will listen. Not even your family. Not even our family, my family. Oh, that's just terrible. Yeah. So it... Um, but not uncommon. Unfortunately, it was very common back then. Um, and it's not uncommon now. It still happens. Uh, we, uh, in the Massachusetts Association for uh, ME and CFS, we struggle to find enough physicians who know something about the illness. We've got about 30. Uh, it's not sufficient to cover the state. And we also get a lot of people coming from other New England states, and, um, which means that uh, our physician's time is taken. And, and so it's a real struggle to find people who know something. I have some heartening information. Uh, we're studying the uh, research database for partners, and there are billions of encounters yes. uh, in, within that system because partners has such a large portion of healthcare care uh, in eastern Massachusetts. And if you look over the last four to five years uh, at primary care referrals to, to the Harvard hospitals, uh, you find that there's a, an exponential increase with patients coming with a coded diagnosis of, of MECFS or question yes. MECFS. Yes. So I'm heartened by that, that there is beginning to be some knowledge in the primary care community yes. in which uh, there's an awareness of the disease and they're asking some, some clinician who's seen many cases uh, to help them confirm uh, such a diagnosis. So I, I see on the horizon an opportunity uh, where the, uh, particularly primary care world, which is one of the, I think, one of the more critical areas to educate, um, is improving. I hope, wholeheartedly agree with that. I, I um, hope it will continue that way, but we still run into situations where people are treated horribly denigrated and go to see uh, the shrink and so forth. Um, I, uh, because the illness was mild, I was able to practice. Uh, and so did you find it, did you end up retiring prematurely, uh, earlier than you had wanted because oh yeah. of the well, disease? I retired at 73. Uh, 
I, I really wanted to practice longer. Uh, but by that time, I began to have more difficulty with uh, comprehending what was being said to me. The brain fog. And the brain fog entered in. Uh, that's not good for a psychiatrist. No, it wasn't. And that's why, basically, uh, it got worse later on. But I figured, you know, I've seen the best, done the best I could. I saw almost 100 patients with ME from all over the Northeast. And I thought it was a time to quit. Problem is, <laughs> uh, I shouldn't laugh, um, there are very, very few psychiatrists who know anything about ME. There are very, very few, even fewer pediatricians, I think. And so that uh, uh, I hung in longer than perhaps I should have because there was no one to, to replace me. Let me ask you, uh, did you find uh, uh, things that helped? Uh, you had a mild to moderate case, so I assume you had some flares, some, some better times and some worse times. Uh, did you find anything that would help or things to avoid that clearly made it worse? Or how did you cope with this? Uh, if I went beyond what's called the energy envelope and did too much for too long, uh, that was not good. You paid a price. Paid a price in two ways. Um, it's like I hit a wall and my mind was not at all functioning well. Uh, I guess the other way is that it took a while for that to lift. Uh, and so continuity became a problem. So I was very careful about my schedule, became more careful about it. and not Became rigid and knew where your limits were. Yes, yes. And I've gotten better at that over the decades. Uh, I've had it for the year, I know the years don't help. Yeah. But going back for a moment, the two incidents of uh, my f acquaintance, Joe, the obstetrician and that incident in Toronto at the APA uh, where by the way Tony Komarov spoke up for the an organ or yes they did a wonderful job um, I found that um, with time um, I could diagnose people pretty easily when my practice there's, uh, there are, of course, people with a different pattern, but most of the people had a pattern of symptoms and um, progress of the illness in such a way that it was quite recognizable. And once I knew what questions to ask and what to look for, I didn't find diagnosis, I think, difficult. difficult at all. You, you had to know the illness in order to do the interview. You have to take a much more intensive history, including from birth on. Uh, and as a child psychiatrist, I was very used to a developmental history, and so I could do that comfortably uh, enough. Um, so uh, let me ask uh, uh, something that's important. Uh, I think that anyone listening to this conversation should recognize if they don't have the disease, it can, uh, anyone can get this disease. That's right. And, uh, and completely suddenly or over a time period. Um, and so we should all be thinking about this because it could happen to, yes, to you. Uh, also, um I had the lucky advantage of contributing as an author to uh, three primers. primers. Uh, we did one uh, just on our own at the Mass um, MECFS Association, which we did in 1992. It was pretty early then, but it went all, all over the world on, on our website. And I began getting calls from Spain and Italy and just, just all over. It was, uh, and I couldn't really help very much uh, at that time. Uh, but it became clear that uh, 
patients reporting to us were saying that the physicians seemed to be more open to the possibility that this was an organic illness. And with that, we decided we needed to give physicians uh, information, basic information. Because there was nothing out there that collectively brought things together. So uh, the association did a primer, as I mentioned, and then a group of us happened to get to know one another, all of us experienced with ME or with family members with ME. And we did an adult primer for the International Association for ME CFS and uh, for um, internists, neurologists. And then we did, um, two years ago, a primer for pediatricians. Um, Let me ask you, uh, the anxiety and frustrations that a physician has, it, it was mentioned in our conference today that they like to make an, a, an affirmative diagnosis and then based on that diagnosis, provide some kind of treatment plan with the patient. Uh, that's appropriate to the diagnosis. And in this particular case, there's tremendous anxiety and frustration because the diagnosis is one of exclusion for the, for the most part, although there are case criteria. Uh, but secondly, even if you, if you give that diagnosis, it's, it's almost a sentence because there really aren't any known treatments for this. And so to a physician, that creates a lot of anxiety and frustration. Yes, well, I'm not quite sure I agree with you that there are no treatments, there's no curative treatment, right. uh, nor is there any uh, medication that will bring about a cure. Uh, but you can treat symptoms. Yes, uh, and that's what really saved me and many other people. The, if Handling the sleep disorder, uh, enabling people to have a decent amount of sleep, um, dealing with the pain, if they had autonomic symptoms with um, uh, various forms of fibrillation, atrial fibrillation, then uh, it was possible to treat them. And that made a huge difference. The most important thing for patients I saw and have heard of uh, since is to let them know what it is that they have. Right. And rather than saying, oh my God, uh, my life is over, they said, oh, thank you. Now I know what I had. And that, it was just, it happened just every time. Just the acknowledgement. Just the acknowledgement that they, they weren't uh, dreaming it up, they weren't crazy, uh, was you very believed important. Them. Pardon me? You believed them. Yes. And the part, Acknowledgement is helpful. That really troubled me very much that there was so much disbelieving among the physicians out there, um, and, and not in a nice way, in, in a way that was uh, really rude, uh, callous, uh, sometimes cruel. And it's not consistent with what a doctor image should should be. Right. I, I thought back to the medical school days and and what we were taught and, and uh, maybe I'm unrealistic but uh, I think we were taught to treat people well and to help them and even if we couldn't help in very concrete ways at least to treat them well. I completely agree with you and it's completely embarrassing to me this behavior happens. Yes. It just seems the antithesis of being a physician. That's right, exactly. And I find it offensive and it's still a challenge. Yes, yeah. Well, um, I want to add a little bit more. Um, when I began to wonder what happened in 1955, between 1955 and 1970, how come the British psychiatrists came up with this cockamamie theory that this is a, a mass hysteria some form? And then I, uh, with some others, have looked at the science, so-called science that they published, and they published a lot. But it was 
pseudoscience. Uh, not many people have looked at it. And what also surprised me is why didn't primary care physicians, instead of swallowing what these guys were telling them that it's all psychological, why did they look at the research? If they had looked at the research that these people had done, the psychiatrists had done, they would have seen it's nonsense. Uh, and it's not at all a psychosomatic illness by any means. I, I, I am not quite familiar with the literature during that particular time period, but uh, nature abhors a vacuum. And in the absence of uh, affirmative high quality science to challenge it, um, then I suppose uh, the, uh, individuals might just look to what there is and go with it. I, that's, not a, that's not a good excuse, but I, you're just asking why did it happen, and I suppose that might be uh, a thought about it. Why did they not look at the research? Why did they pay no attention to the people, few people who are out there who were still working on the organic aspects, uh, whose voices were lost during this time? The IOM report from 2015 was a huge breakthrough. Uh, I wish it was more of a breakthrough than it was, but it was a significant document and it spelled out in very direct terms, what had been happening, how people were being treated, how had uh, there were not enough research funds uh, that we knew relatively very little, and it spelled it out in detail, and it gave us a kind of roadmap for what the future needed to be, you know, what kind of research, and done how, so forth. So it's a major document. I want to wrap the interview up. Uh, but I'd like to do it in a, in, in a positive way and sure. so that the community has a sense of hope uh, going forward. So you've followed this development of the disease over a very long time period and it's, it's affected you personally. Mm -hmm. So how do you see since the IOM report uh, how research and things are progressing? Do you, uh, are, you, are you encouraged? Uh, I am very encouraged. I'm thrilled by it. The conference today, the level of uh, science that was being um, discussed, uh, it, it's a world of difference. Uh, and I feel like uh, I don't know how much more I could work, but uh, I feel like uh, I can retire. I'm leaving it in good hands, and they're just wonderful people now working in the field. Good. I, I'm very heartened by your perspective on it, and uh, I also have hope. <laughs>